Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Dubious Knowledge. I am Jason. I'm not GMing again tonight. I'm gonna get it right one of these days where I'm gonna say I'm not your GM. But with me, we don't have Corey, unfortunately. But never fear. We have Mike here. What's what's happening, Mike? Hey, how's it going, Jason? Yeah, I'm I'm here. I'm up. I'm alive. It's not like uh the previous two times where I was asleep and uh, needing five bags of IV fluid. But I'm here like I was going to miss the Dwarf Daddy talk. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, this week we are talking about Torag. Torag. The, the father of creation. The father of Dwarven kind. The Forge Father. And what better time to, to talk about Torag than the month of June 2023 right as the release of Lost Omens High Helm. So you're li either listening to this, de it depends on when it comes out. So it's either about a week after, two weeks after it comes out, or if you're listening to it a lot later, you know, <laughs> whenever you get around to actually listening to the episode. <laughs> but with us, once again, we have Steven, Sir Vertigo. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Glad to be on the show again. Yeah, so uh, Stephen was on our episode on Lamashtu, and uh, if you didn't get a chance to listen to that episode, uh, why don't we tell the audience a little bit about you and your YouTube channel and your Discord server? Yeah, uh, I have a YouTube channel called Sir Vertigo where I just discuss whatever I can about Pathfinder lore. I like to hit the gods, locations, races. I'm trying really hard at the moment to get the player races done so you can have a good primer. If you're a new player going into Pathfinder for the first time, you can learn what each race is history is about. Um, I've also got a Discord server called the Midnight Torch, where individuals who like the lore can get together and talk. We are trying to create an in-universe guild that will basically be able to be put in a game and be a, another faction that you could use in your own home games. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. But yeah, we are talking about Torag. So who, first of all, who here is excited for Lost Omens High Helm? I mean, do we need to say you, Jason? The guy who <laughs> we all know as Dwarf Daddy? Like, that's a rhetorical question, right? Well, I, I'm excited, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, for sure. But, but the, are, the, are the two of you excited? Oh, yeah. I love the dwarves. I, um, Sir Vertigo was this close to being a dwarf. I just felt like I needed to make him look kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we all have a little dwarf in us. You know what I mean? We all have that that let's drink and have a good time. <laughs> right, right. It's especially just coming off of PaizoCon and some of the content they shared about High Helm. I'm so looking forward to it. And so just like having this episode, what, two days after PaizoCon, we're recording this so we can have it out for the audience for the release of the High Helm book. Yeah, let's... Let's get right into it. I'm excited. Mike, how about you run us through just the mechanical basics of Torag? That's usually uh, Corey's duty, but she she's preoccupied tonight. She's unable to join us. We wish her all the best. But Mike's going to handle it. I'm going to do my best. That's big shoes to fill. I got big shoes to fill. Once again, Torag, the father of creation, the father of dwarven kind, the forge father... He is a lawful good deity. His father's followers could be lawful good, lawful neutral, and in 1A, only neutral good, which is kind of weird. Uh, Ariel's areas of concern would be the forge, protection, and strategy. His domains, uh, I'll do first edition because we have to mention first edition. Pretty soon we'll only mention second edition. Thank you, guys. Artifice, earth, good law protection with the subdomains of the Archon, Caves, Construct, Defense, Fortifications, Industry, Judgment, Metal, and Toil. For a second edition, Creation, Earth, Family, Protection with the alternative domain of Duty. Here's a big surprise. Favorite weapon, a Warhammer. 
<laughs> being the forge god. Of course, it would be a Warhammer, right? Worshippers primarily are dwarves, but I'm pretty sure uh, there are many, many other ancestries that worship Torog. Yeah, uh, they actually mentioned that. They went into that a little bit in the Lost Omens High Helm panel, where they're talking about how in second edition now we're they're seeing a lot more. They're seeing a lot more other ancestries start to worship the dwarven pantheon and the dwarven deities. So we're they're seeing more humans, more orcs, strangely enough, more orcs, hmm. and uh, more halflings actually starting are starting to worship the dwarven pantheon. They they specifically call, called out Trude as one of the examples, and they kind of did a little bit of a deep dive into Trude, but. But yeah, they're 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 saying that like the dwarven pantheon is growing to the point where more more than just dwarves are worshiping them. So, but yes, primarily dwarves. Yes, primarily dwarves. Uh, the centers of worship are Druma, the Five Kings Mountains, the land of the Lindworm Kings, which is a special place in my heart currently, and the Mana Wastes. Uh, their holy sim his holy symbol is a stylized warhammer. Again, surprise. And his realm is called the Forge Heart and it's located in he- the Plain of Heaven. Yeah, there we'll get into that a little bit a little bit later. There's a fun bit of well we'll say narrator's bias on on how heaven was founded. <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit. For the edicts and anathemas, I'll, I'll go over those real quick. They should be it's pretty pretty self-explanatory. Torag is the lawful good deity, so be honorable and forthright. Keep your word. Respect the forge. Serve your people. For the anathema is don't tell lies or cheat somebody. Don't intentionally create inferior works. And don't show mercy to the enemies of your people. I mean, what could be you said it right before we hit the record button, Mike. What could be more Torag than that? <laughs> now, when it comes to Paladins of Torag, and uh, I'm, I'm sad that Corey wasn't able to make it. Corey is our resident champion or Paladin player, uh, specifically Paladin. She, temp- she tends to play a lot of good champions. But uh, the Paladins of Torag are, and I'm, I'm using her words here, so this is this is quoted from her document that she prepared. Dedicated to protecting not just the lives, but the way of life for those under their charge and hold the ways of their people as holy, especially when they are the centuries old works and traditions of an entire race. Their tenets include the following affirmation. My word is my bond. When I give my word formally, I defend my oath to my death traps lie in idle banter and thoughtless talk, and so I watch my tongue. Number two. I am at all times truthful, honorable, and forthright but my allegiance is to my people. I will do what is necessary to serve them, including misleading others, if need be. Number three. I respect the forge and never sully it with half-hearted works. My creations reflect the depth of my faith, and I will not allow flaws save in the direst need. And finally, against my people's enemy, I will show no mercy. I will not allow their surrender except when strategy warrants. I will defeat them, yet even in the direst struggles, I will act in a way that brings honor to Torak. And that is just the epitome of what you think of a paladin of Torak should be, right? Yeah. That that last little bit made me want to scream badger. Like Wolverines, <laughs> right? Well, I'm glad every now. See, I hope everyone got that joke. I hope I right. hope you guys at home are laughing at that good joke that I have. That's my one for the night. Other than that, I'm just going to shoot shitty puns all night. Which was which was a pun because the um, the sacred animal of Torag it's, is a badger. badger. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, Torag is the head of the Dwarven pantheon. When we when, th- when we talk about dwarves, we tend to talk about, especially when it comes to the core 20, we talk about Torag. He is like the one. But the dwarven pantheon itself is 
there's what? How many others? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's ten, including Torag. Ten gods in the Dwarven Pantheon inclu that, that include Angrod, the god of war, Torag's younger brother, Bolka, the goddess of love and family, which is Torag's daughter, Drangvit, which is Torag's half-sister, the uh, goddess of debt, Droskar, who is the evil dwarven god. He is actually used to be a former student of Torag, the evil god of toil and cheating. And he, they're kind of going to retcon him a little bit because he was also the god of slavery. And they're, they're kind of doing away with the concept of slavery in, in Galarian moving forward in second edition. So they're, they're going to kind of retcon that out and do some work on it, which is good. Fulgrit, which is Torag's wife, the god of mothers, goddess of mothers. Grundinar, which is Torag's son, the god of friendship. Coles, Torag's other son, the god of duty. Magrim, Torag's older brother, the dwarven god of death. And Trude, which we mentioned above, who is Torag's youngest. He is the god of bravery. And I, w I do want to call this out, that during the Paisocon panel, it was a, it was quite fun. And Eleanor Farron went on <clears throat> a little bit of a rant and talking about, you know, Bolka and Trude, just some of the gods that we're going to get in Lost Omens High Helm, <clears throat> and some of the lore behind them. And she was talking about how Trude is starting to be worshipped by a lot more followers beyond just dwarves. And she's like, and he's sitting there just kind of like, I don't really know what to do with this. You know, I have halflings and orcs and humans starting to worship me. And I don't know how to handle this. And and um, apparently he goes to talk to Torag and Torag's like super busy. So he goes to talk to some of the other gods, like, how do we handle all this? And he ends up going to talk to Caden Kalian, who is a good friend of Torag's. They're super good buddy buddies. And he ends up having a fling with Caden Kalian, and they end up hooking up, and they're kind of an item. <laughs> Which is just so Caden Kalian. We'll get, we'll get into that when we do the Caden episode. And then Bolka, the the his sister, his older sister, she's like, you know, you you get it, dude. You go get it. Like love is love. You just you you you, you go you chase it. Go after your heart, buddy. <laughs> so since we're speaking of the other members of the pantheon, do you know the reason Droskar was cursed by Torag by any chance? I don't actually. He was originally one of the greatest students of Torag's, and Torag would basically brag on him all the time, like, look how good my student is. Well, Torag eventually found out that Droskar was passing off the work of another dwarf that Droskar had enslaved and was claiming it as his own. Oh, shit, so, really? Torag cursed him to never be able to create an original work again. So he can, no matter how hard he tries, he can never make anything new. That's his own creation. That, yeah, that 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 would do it. That would do it. That's got to be the worst curse for a dwarf. <laughs> like, I that explains no why other, he um, yeah. he grabbed the dwarves that were left behind and twisted them because he couldn't make something for himself, basically. Right. Well, uh, speaking of making, uh, Stephen, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the to Torag's history with when it comes to Rovagug? Because I know he was involved with with that big battle, right? Yes, Torag, and I'm wanting to say it was. I always get these two mess mixed up. It was either Gorum or Gazra it, um, together. It was Gorum. The pair of Gorum. That's what I thought. The pair of them worked in the forges and created the bars that would go on to make the walls of Rovagug's demiplane, basically. 
and um, the rest of the gods went on to distract Rovagug while Torag and Gorum slaved away at this prison for Rovagug. Damn. <laughs> I love the Rovagug myth. That's one of my favorite myths from Pathfinder. Yeah, it's it's super cool. Like it's there's that there's that that painting or that mural that mm -hmm. shows that, all the gods. Fighting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it it's so epic. But yeah, like, and just like the fact that it took a dwarven god, a dwarven god of creation, and then Gorum, the Lord of Iron to build the prison that is housing Rovagug. I love the fact that each god contributed something in some way like Torag and Gorum, they built the prison. Um, Saren Ray is the one who basically pushed him into the prison. Kalistra is the one who baited him toward it. Let's see. Do Asmodeus locked him in there with the key. Yeah, he made the, he made the lock. Thought, yeah. Zon Kuthon made the uh, Star Pillars. I think. Is yes. that the name of them? Star Pillars? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they would uh, basically, like giant acupuncture, they would bury into his body and make it to where he couldn't give powers to his clerics. And each little god had their own little thing to try to keep him away. When, it, when even Asmodeus is like, no, this dude's bad news. <laughs> I believe, um, I believe it was actually Abadar who made the lock. Um, Asmodeus was the only one clever to be able to work the lock. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, uh, that was, that's correct. Yeah, and he's the one who have who has the key. He has the key, which, which I believe is no longer the case. I think Grandmother Spider was actually, actually stole the key from Asmodeus. She's the one who has the key now. Oh, she managed to See, steal it. <laughs> the last I had heard of the key is that it's um, prophesized that Ismodius will let Rovagug out to stop some greater evil one day. I can only think of one greater evil than Rovagug, and I'm super excited to talk about that when Cynthia, when Cynthia comes on. I'm just saying it might be a great old one, right? Yogg-Sothoth? It would have to be either Yogg-Sothoth or, I mean... I can't even say Cthulhu because Cthulhu doesn't want to destroy creation. He wants everybody to go crazy. But that's the I that's, love old that's, gods. that's for the way. We have twenty we have we have the, the core twenty to get through before we get to the old ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. While we're on the case while we're on the subject of Torag lore, there's not a whole lot to go on. Torag lore is pretty sparse. Be besides the imprisoning of Rovagog, there is only one more thing where Torag's lore is really big, and that's the quest for Sky. And beyond that, there's not a whole lot. As a matter of fact, this episode won't have a spoiler corner because by the time this episode is being recorded, we do not currently have Sky King's Tomb. And when Sky King's Tomb does come out, that's going to rewrite a lot of what we know about Dwarven history and a lot of what we know about the quest for Sky. So that will be a big, big part of it. And we might have to get the three of us back at a later date to do an addendum to this when after we get through Sky King's Tomb. But that's that's a later point. But the Mike, do you want to take us through uh, the, the quest for Sky and how that prophecy went? Yeah. Short version, Tori gave the dwarves a prophecy that one day the earth will shake and they will leave their home to go upward for the quest for Sky. During Earthfall, uh, sub-5293 AR, when the comets, basically, hit Galarian, the dwarf said, this is our sign, and started running up towards the, you know, towards the sky. Uh, they were followed, I believe, by uh, the term was all things dark, which included orcs, but now orcs are, you know, we all love orcs. I love an orc, a good orc, uh, and including the Darklands, the things from the Darklands as well. So, right. uh, in doing that, where they they found the 
I don't want to say Star Cathedrals because that's not right. Sky Citadels. Sky Citadels. Close enough. Yeah. F- forming those, they that those were their exit and exit points. But I just think the idea of a bunch of dwarves digging out, and then right behind them, there's just the quote unquote raving masses of of orcs and all the Darkland things. Just right. It's a cool visual of them, you know, being stalwart defenders, standing their ground on the back end while everyone else is pushing forward. It gives a very like, you know, that dwarf feeling. Let's say. Yeah. So the 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 myth, the creation myth for the dwarves is that Torag created the world. He he created the world by striking his hammer on a great forge, and when he struck the hammer. Like the sparks that flew from his hammer off of his forge is what gave birth to the dwarves. It's what filled their bellies full of fire. Like that created the dwarves. Those those sparks, that spark of life. Lip that literal spark of life. That's what And they were down in the Darklands. Then that's that's where they that's where they were. But like you said, it's like the prophecy was is that once there was going to be a great earthquake, something was going to shake the world, and it's at that point that Torag's chosen were to quest for the sky, literally dig their way out, and that's what the Sky King's tomb is going to tell us all about. Is like what actually happened, because I mean, think about it. You have. Millions and millions of dwarves followed by a horde mm-hmm. of orcs and goblins and, and a number of other things just like running after them. And what the denizens of the Darklands, like these innocent these innocent folk are just like living their lives. And you got this giant like march like what happened what the hell like imagine like you're just some some like some random person living down in the darklands and you see this like mass of dwarves followed by a mass of orcs i don't think people realize how long the quest of sky took either that was in a it was like 300 years 300 years yeah it took them and, a long time um, it's because not only would they stop to fight the orcs which inevitably evolved the orcs because they stole the secrets to like crafting and all of that from the dwarves. They also started infighting amongst themselves because parts of the dwarves were like, hey, maybe this wasn't the prophecy that we were talking about. Maybe this is just something else. Yep. And it took them 300 years to get to the surface. And if it wasn't for High King Targic to finally unite everybody Mm -hmm. to get them up to the surface, they probably wouldn't have made it I, I love the I have the idea in my head of the what like of it being passed down to like an order of, of dwarven clerics of just like your job is to wait for the one day the prophecy starts and let all of us know and it just be that you know the, the dwarf just sitting there sleeping and all of a sudden the earth starts shaking <laughs> a little bit and he's like looks around and then it starts shaking real you know obviously with comets and asteroids hitting the planet the earth is it's going to shake and just start ringing the bell and everybody's just getting ready to go and it's just that one old dwarf long you know white beard all the clasps and cool shit just hefting a hammer and running up trying to get in there that's just (laughs) it tickles me man i don't know why like i love dwarves because i love to play like in my head dwarves are funny like I don't like how Tolkien did dwarves. Like, they're funny. You know, the, the, the dwarves that we know from Tolkien, by the way, I'm a huge Tolkien nerd. You know, they kind of have humor, but they're n- not that funny. You know, they're not he- they're not hobbits funny. Mm-hmm. But yeah, every time I play a dwarf, I always make them humorous. You know, they can be serious, but they also, they party. They, you know, they're, they, they drink, they party. They like to let loose every once in a while. Yeah. And and not to get on my high horse, I think um, Peter Jackson went too far to the comedy with the dwarves. I think Gimli became 
Gimli became comic relief, and to the point where I was just like, "Oh man, Gimli's not that much of a comic relief." No. Gimli's a, a fighter. He's no, he's a he's a warrior. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a, a we're, 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 we're getting lost. The Tolkien cast. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I um. I had a dwarf that played in one of my games, one of my longer lasting games. That was a cleric of Torag. And his whole thing was that in our game, a lot of the gods had kind of gone silent. Like they weren't not answering anyone's calls. They just weren't as active as they used to be. And his dwarf's whole thing was he was going to different parts of the world and crafting things to see if he could hear Torag's call through the hammer, basically. And, um, I don't think we ever got to finish his story, but he had finally gotten like a feeling of some kind of response when he was crafting at one of the Sky Citadels. But I think our group fell apart shortly after that, and we never got to finish it, unfortunately. And this is, that's a great segue, because out of all the gods, you know, a lot of the gods don't really, aren't super chatty to their worshippers. But other than Phrasma, who is basically silent, doesn't really ever talk to her worshippers, and Zan Kuthan, who does, does he because he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care about his worshippers at <laughs> all. <laughs> he, he couldn't give a flying fuck. But um, Torag, he is pretty silent for a deity because he he actually believes that you're you. If you're a worshiper of Torag, you need to have a little bit of struggle. You need to have a little bit of struggle in your life. And if you, if you are a little bit too sheltered, you're not going to experience that hardship and you're not going to know the value of your own strength and your own worth. So he tends to be a little bit more quiet, a little bit more standoffish. Now, when he does talk, he usually does it through like engravings and stones and stuff like that but like he doesn't speak through dreams like Desna does he or, or Lamash too for that matter she also speaks through but nightmares since you mentioned how he like shows his approval through stone I want to mention that they also says that um, he shows his approval through reflections of his face on polished metal and I don't know why, but that got me so tickled when I was reading that, because in my head I imagined this dwarf glancing over at a nicely polished shield and, like, seeing the reflection of another dwarf and just immediately screaming that Torag approves. And I just feel <laughs> like that must have happened all the damn time in these dwarven forges. <laughs> <laughs> like, every little thing had Torag's approval, because you just constantly see him. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, he, um, he 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 tends to be, he t- does tend to be a bit standoffish, so that's not too uncommon. But yeah, he's 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 a crafter. He um, speaking of the forge, the one thing I do like is that he opposes the the actual destruction of anything of anything that's been crafted. Like he doesn't he doesn't want his followers to be buried in their armor are buried with their sword or buried with their axe. If it's a really well-made axe or a really finely made uh, shield, like, w- once you're dead, give it to somebody else because it can be used. It can, or, it, can, it can help protect somebody else. Or it can even be sold to bring money back into the community. He specifically mentions that he's okay with you even selling it as long as it's getting a use. Mm-hmm. See that kind of don't, don't, okay. don't, yeah, don't go, don't let it go to waste by being buried in it with it. Like the the, it kind of makes you think like it's almost like a generational weapon or a generational work of art, you know, like a great warrior. I mean, I can only think of one that might be spoiler for Giant Slayer, one dwarf that has like two artifacts. That happens very early in the AP. That you know they were they were buried with it, and it, yeah, you're right. It, it doesn't. Torak really doesn't want 
any good dwarven works to be hidden, to go to go unused, to go unappreciated for their craftsmanship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's that when I read that 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 really struck me as something a little bit out of the ordinary for like a medieval fantasy setting because I always imagine like you know you 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 get this this image in your head like the traditional medieval fantasy especially eurocentric medieval fantasy the knight needs to be buried with his sword and buried with his shield in his armor. You know, the king is the king is buried in this gilded armor. But like Dorag's like, nope, dude, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Let, don't, don't let, let that it go, go to waste. waste. <laughs> right. Underclothes and a thank you. That's what they're buried with. The only other thing I don't think we've mentioned at the moment. Torag is directly responsible for the only gnomish deity, uh, Nivi mm-hmm. Rombo Dazzle. She was a gambler who um, basically racked up a ton of debt, but somehow she managed to trade a special gemstone to Torag in exchange for godhood. And, um,. It's rumored she's the reason that the gnomes are now in the material plane from the first realm, so she's pretty decently important to the gnomes. I think that the the gem she traded, honestly, is her symbol, the seven pipped dice, the red, the ruby seven pipped dice. I think that might be the thing that she gave because it's such a strange item. It's a six-sided die with seven pips on it. Which would be great for me because I can't roll above a fucking six. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, beyond that, I, now it's really to kind of just to kind of go into a little bit of his church structure. I think the only other thing I wanted to bring up was that one more thing is that again, again <laughs> this is counter to a lot of what we what was the assumptive position in Eurocentric medieval fantasy? <laughs> Torag is not about martyrdom. He's like, do not go get yourself killed, dude. No. He does not believe that there is any glory whatsoever in being a martyr. He's like, I- I'll honor those who sacrifice themselves for others, but there is no glory in being uh, being a martyr just for being a martyr, just for the sake of being a martyr. Well, it get, sounds it, like it sounds like Torag's just kind of the god of being practical at this point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For a fantasy realm, like he's he's anti all of the um, standard cliches. He's just like, no, just live, fight, protect. Don't waste your stuff. He's a very practical god in a very unpractical setting for the most part. He's definitely I mean, he's a, a dwarf. dwarf. <laughs> he's definitely a coupon. <laughs> That's of the, true. Of the pantheon. He definitely is the one who does the couponing, for sure. <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. I mean, that might be Abadar, but that might be Abadar. Yeah, Abadar is definitely a member of the Gold Club. Any any <laughs> well, specialty? Torag Abad- doesn't turn down the coupons. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. But Abadar is the one that has the app that has all of the coupons for every single reward. He he owns every single reward card to every single store. This is the part where you launch into the sponsorship for honey.com. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the church of the church of Torag is um it's exactly what you think it is. A god of strategy, protection, and like what what would you think it is it's it is exactly what you think it is the priests are there to they craft armor they craft weapons they build defenses for the the settlements where the church is located they help instruct militias on how to use their those weapons and how to use their shields and how to properly defend the settlement like here are our weak points. 
How do you properly defend it? It's, again, practical. It's, it's super practical to the point where there's some settlements where the actual temple of Torag is the perimeter wall. Like the temple is the perimeter wall. Like what better perimeter wall can you think of than a dwarven temple? I almost made an anime reference. It was so that's so difficult for me not to make them every time I get a chance to. You talking about Attack on Titan? I was gonna attack. Yeah, I was gonna say until a gigantic, you know, massive, tall, skinless being shows up and tries to take the wall down. Yeah, that's that's interesting because most, I mean, if you think about it, most perimeter walls in our history also had a forge. Most of them had forges in them to be able to repair weapons, to be, be able to make weapons if need be. You know, it does kind of make sense, and it's perfect for someone who's about protecting and fortification and creation. You know, it, it does mm-hmm. make all the sense, really. Yeah, when it comes to the church, though, the um He's pretty, pretty standard. He he strongly encourages his followers to get married. It's not it's not a it's not mandatory, but it's encouraged. He also encourages his followers to have children, and if you can't have children, look at adoption. It's not again not mandatory, but strongly encouraged. There's a there's a there's a bit in in the in the literature that, you know, a dwarven couple might go decades without actually having any children, which he doesn't mind because it's a long term plan and they're dwarves and they're long lived. It doesn't really matter. He says there, there you might there, there and the fact that if you if you do go unmarried it's it's okay. And I and I made a comment here. It's like, it is it is traditional for an unmarried priest to be spiritually betrothed to a celestial servitor. I highlighted this passage, and I uh, b- made a comment that, and then my comment says it's very similar to priests and nuns in the Catholic Church, where you. It, 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 when growing up Catholic, and when I went to to uh, confirmation class, the nuns there were sa- w- would say that they were married to Jesus, like that. My I'm married to Jesus, like that's my husband, like and so like the concept of the priests and priestesses in the Church of Torag being married to a celestial servitor. And we'll we'll get to we'll get to some of the the important ones later. Yeah, it just, it, that rang that again that rang up real, real true to me. Studying the Catholic Church, I um, I particularly like the way they explain devotion to Torag in the Fates of Purity source book. It says, Torag is not a god of half measures. Either you worship him or you don't. Either you take his doctrine as it is or you don't. Yours is not a religion of convenience, and when you are of the faith, you are expected to remain orthodox in all ways. His beliefs are just as stubborn as he is, basically. And I have that too, That, and I actually highlighted the passage right after that. Where it's like, there's the three pillars, you know, when you, when you look at a bar stool, there's three legs and right afterwards the passage, right? <laughs> literally right after you said that, Stephen, it says offer every action they take in, in service of their goals. Number one, the safety of their people. Number two, the defeat of their enemies. And number three, the production of useful, sturdy tools for civilization. Life is a precious gift and every breath should be taken to have purpose to to it. Even if that purpose is simply enjoying the company of friends and a mug of ale. It's just like he as it doesn't matter what your life goal is. As long as 
does it like to to Torag? It doesn't matter what life anyone's life goal is. You need to protect it. If if if, you, if somebody's life goal could just be simply to drink a mug of ale, and that's it. And it doesn't matter. Life is precious to him, and it should and it deserves to be protected. And to me, that that just that struck me. That struck me. It's like I I, I really enjoyed that part. Yes. You know, it's impressive when some of these deities you can read about them, and you're just kind of like, man, I'm going to start acting like that in my real life. (laughs) Right. Some of these beliefs and stuff, they just make you want to be a better person. It feels like. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, so the we talked about some of the talked about the churches, some of the settlements, about how I ran over how the settlements build their temples to be the outer defensive walls. Here's one thing that I highlighted too, and I wanted to. I, I will we'll revis- revisit this. Um, this is the very last sentence in the temples and shrines section of Inner Sea Gods. The most sacred places are those that have been retaken from orcs and other enemies, and shrines may be built there to commemorate the return to dwarven control. And the reason I highlighted that is because that is the, I believe, and don't quote me on this, I think that's going to be the the crescendo, the end of Sky King's Tomb, is the retaken of Koldukar. Which is now known as Urgir. Urgir in Orkish. Oh man, that's gonna be good. Which it, which was the um, wasn't that wasn't that the 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 Sky Citadel that um, where King Targic is laid to rest, right? Is in Koldakar. There's I have to put forward one of my theories real quick. Give me just a second to pull this document back up. No, not a problem. Go for it. You were gonna say, Mike? I was gonna say, I, yeah, I, I, I really want to fight and take back a Sky Citadel, and and because I really want to take back Helm's Deep, I really want to, I really. Yeah, really because think. there's because there's only two. Because of the Sky Citadels that remain, two of them are under enemy control. Well, when I say enemy, non-dwarven control, and that's Cold Dukar and Yormagand. And Yormagand is up in... That's up by Sarkora Scar, right? I'm going to go check real quick, but I think yes. Yeah, I think that's up by Sarkoris. Okay. I'll let you finish this part, and then I've got to mention this theory I had in my dwarf video. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk. Where's Jormungand? Pathfinder. Uh, yeah, Jormungand located in Wolfscrag. By the Frost Wolfscrag? Wound, by the Frostmire in the in the world. It's by the world world wound. The Frostmire okay. region. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's up there. Yeah. It and felt, it's currently it's currently under what I'm guessing undead control. Gray elf. Gray Elf control. Okay. Yeah. Notice I didn't say the word. I now know what they're called. Yeah, I forget what, what what's their actual name now. They gave them a name. Oh, originally they were Drogar, but that's Durgar. Yeah, but Durgar. I don't know. They yeah they have a name now. I don't know. I I'll have to read. I'll have to remember it. They mentioned it in um, in Paizo Khan with the they're not called Dwargar anymore because of the OGL stuff. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Steven, your your theory. Okay. So when I did my dwarf race video, I noticed a weird pattern about major events in the Dwarven race's history. And I, it could just be a random pattern, but it felt weird that there was four examples of this that all followed the same pattern. When the dwarves first came from the Darklands in the quest for Sky, Tardargath fell, the five kingdoms were formed, and they would go on to fight 19 civil wars between each other that lasted 760 years. 
They would then form a peace treaty, but were attacked by orcs who would go on to occupy the mountains for 705 years. A dwarf by the name of Cadam the Mighty would defeat the orcs and bring on 701 years of prosperity, only for the kingdom to fall to a massive volcanic eruption. The last major event happened in 3980 AR, and the current year is 4723 AR. We're due for a major shakeup of dwarven culture within the next 20 or so years to fit the pattern, and we have a dwarf book right around the corner. <laughs> if they have something big in plan, it would follow that pattern. <laughs> and I asked Eric Mona about this on Reddit, and the only thing he replied was a winky face. So I don't know if that means it is something they've planned or what. <laughs> but <laughs> that's a weird pattern if it's a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the taking back of Cole Dukar would be huge and taking back the city that where King Target lay Target lays would be massive for for the dwarves. Because he's he's like their almighty hero. He is their King Arthur, you know? Yeah. And I mean, we're right there in that time span that it would still be twenty years of the within twenty years of the latest date that something happened and I just thought that was a really cool coincidence when I noticed all that. Yeah, that is super cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Anyway, b- back on track. Let's get back on track. The priests, priests, priest role. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the three pillars, safety, defeat of the enemies, and production of useful goods. How every life is precious. As far as a lot of the military and the the orders that that pledged themselves to to serving serving the Church of Torag, it's it's your typical clerics, champions, cavaliers, fighters. This your your typical dwarven player classes. But one of the things that really stood out to me or I should say a couple of the ones that really stood out to me are bards. And I mean, it shouldn't because they are the, the folk, the folklore, they, they sing the songs and they keep the, they keep the stories of their history and the heroes. But though, here's the one that really kind of came out of left field. Barbarians. Barbarians also really have a place in the church. And they say here in the, in the passage is barbarians often, they often approve of Torag's black and white worldview, like this binary worldview that you, that you talked about, Stephen, about how, you know, it's, 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 he's not a god of half measures. Either mm-hmm. you accept the doctrine or you don't. And they devote themselves to, to the church in order to tame that, that rage that they have inside them or to channel it into a way or find a way to channel it to better serve the people. So it, that one really kind of stuck out to me. Like I was just like, oh, that's that's fascinating because I've never really seen. Granted, we haven't we haven't gone over Gorham yet, but I haven't really seen that called out in especially in, a, in such a orderly tactical, you know, church. Yeah, but it does kind of you. It does make sense, you know. A barbarian is very one. It's either yes or no with a barbarian. Typically, when people play barbarians, it's either like, "Am I going to kill it or am I not going to kill it?" You know what I mean? That's that's how Torag is. It's either you're in or you're out. There's no, you know. Hey, hey, Mike, you are a marine. The barbarians are the marines. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Eat with the, eat with me or eat a box of bullets is well. <laughs> Battle axe, I guess, would be the best way to put it. I don't want to talk about dwarven gunslingers. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it just kind of really struck out to me. It's just like you, you, you think of the Church of Torag as so like meticulous and tactical, and they really make these strategic decisions, and they really kind of go over that about how 
Um, if you're playing a, a worshiper of Torag, you really want to be involved. If you're not the party leader, they, they actually say here, like playing an adventure, if you're not the party leader, you want to have the party leader's ear because you want to be there to offer tactical advice. And like, as, as I'm just picturing like a barbarian worshiper of Torag, it's just like, should I kick down the door? That's my tactical advice. Want me to kick it? The, those hinges look like they weren't tempered good enough. I could just kick it real quick. You want me to do that? I can do it real quick. We're going to check for weakness in this door. Hey, guess what? Now I want to play a barbarian. Now I want to play barbarian in, in, in high hope. Thanks. But yeah, that the, just um, gives... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Steven. No, go ahead. That just gives me this image of like this barbarian who thinks he's coming up with these super detailed battle plans and it all boils down to do I hit him or not? <laughs> that would be a great gimmick. That would be <laughs> such a great gimmick. <laughs> so your plan boils down to instead of punching him from the front, you're going to walk behind him and punch him. Yeah, Challenge pretty much. accepted, Steven. Challenge <laughs> accepted. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, other military orders that that devote themselves to church to the church. There's there's a bunch of them that that do that because they because again Torag's church is so militant, regimented, and tactical minded that if you belong to a military order, you really value the the church of Torag and their inputs. And they say here that knights of the Church of Torag and I made a, I made a note here <clears throat> these knights have little use for the needless ceremonies common to other knightly orders and speak only when necessary though they usually still relax and allow themselves to laugh in the company of friends and family when the time comes to act they do so without hesitation placing themselves between their people in danger war hammers at the ready and my comment to this was, speak softly and carry a big stick. It's basically. Uh, one of the Hell Knight orders, the Order of the God Claw, venerate the lawful aspects of Toreg, but they don't really follow the religious parts of him. Just basically keep in mind all his uh, lawful aspects and strategy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I need to I need to read up more about the Hell Knights, to be honest. That's a that's a glaring glaring omission on my part. I don't know a ton about them. I know the God Claws, they worship Avidar, Asmodeus, Imade, Aurori, and Torag. But and the, other than that, I don't know much about them. <laughs> and then lastly, um, and this one will speak uh Speaking of Mike and his military background, the church itself has a military hierarchy. The the highest rank in the church is the high defender, um, and he presides over all of the church of Torag, and he pre- and he is re- resides in the fortress temple at the uh, Forge of Torag and High Helm. And then underneath him, he has his, his military council who are kind of like the cardinals of the Church of Torag. So it's basically a very military structured hierarchy. And the church itself grants promotions to, in the church based off of heroic acts of defense and battle uh, tactical decision making and innovations in smithing, forging, and smelting. So again, one of these churches where it's not really all about the magical power, that's more about your deeds. Uh, one thing interesting I found about the dwarves, and it's just is a, I don't know if this could be considered spoiler, so I guess I'll say spoiler, 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 if you don't want to get spoiled Fast forward three minutes. Now, one of the keys that bound Tarbafan was given to the dwarves after the Silver Crusade, during the Silver Crusade. It was basically mm. just like 
One was given to the elves. One was given to the to the Silver Crusade, the actual faction, at the Knights of Ozum. And one was given mm-hmm. to the, the dwarves. I don't remember this guy said it all at the time. But that's something interesting, the fact that, like, the, be- the worst thing that's ever happened to us, we're giving you something that holds them back. You know what I mean? But, you know, we I don't mean, know how that ends. If you if you would want somebody to defend you, it would be the be the doors, right? Yeah. Did we mention his herald by any chance, the Grand Defender? Not yet, not yet. We'll get, we'll get to that. Um, there's a couple things I want to get to first. This is a particular thing. If you're going to role play a worshiper of Torag, this is something that I thought was super duper cool and I had no idea about this, is that a a character who's particularly devoted to Torag likes to wear rings, either on their fingers, in their hair, or in their ears. And every ring tells a story, because each one is marked with the symbol of Torag, which is the the, um, hammer and forge, the hammer, right? The, and... They, it, it also has an indication of how the bearer earned that ring, whether it's service to a friend, fealty to a lord, discovery of a new metal vein, so on and so forth. So you would you'll see that a particularly devout worshiper of Torag will have a lot of rings on them, whether like again in their hair, their facial hair, their ears, their 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 fingers what have you. I thought that was really kind of a cool bit that I didn't know about. Dwarf comes rocking up with 15 Super Bowl rings on. <laughs> right? <laughs> that just further st- that just further pushes the stereotype of dwarves not being good at stealth. Just the most devout, <laughs> just little ching, 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 ching. <laughs> Might as well tie bells in his beard. <laughs> I mean, That'd be the, that'd be something great to just. That'd be a really interesting character quirk. Just be like, yeah, I'm not quiet. You know I'm coming. Don't worry, yep. I'm gonna earn yep. another ring soon by taking you down. Who wants to talk about the hammer and tongs? I'm afraid I don't know this one. The hammer and tongs. The hammer, hammer and, tongs. and tongs. The forging yeah. of metals and other good works. Uh, that is the holy text for the Church of oh. uh, Torag. Uh, Torag, sorry. It's meant to be a reference near forges and other situations where other books would catch fire because these books are bound in metal and the leather pages are coated in fireproof lacquer. So you could have them in hot temperatures in near the forge so you could have it by you without it catching on fire because books don't like heat. Inside of it, there are prayers and stories of the creation of the early days of the Dwarven races. There's the destinies that they are that they have forged, the quest for the sky, uh, the need for a community that binds all elves, all I said elves, all dwarves together. It also gives instructions on how to shape stone, build walls, smelt the basic metals, how to forge iron and steel, and other information uh, about monsters that they have fought and how to kill them. So it's basically like I want to say the Wasteland Survivor's Guide for any Fallout fans. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know. It's like it's it's the book your granddad gave you with all like how to do this. You know. It's the journals from Gravity Falls. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Pretty much. Yeah it's uh, we finally we get a we get a holy text that's like a legit holy yeah. text and not a know, skull, a, a talking skull or, you know, <laughs> just shreds skin. of skin. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, that's what happens when you find the Leviathan, okay? Your skin shreds. That's what happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've all seen the new Hellraiser. We know how that ends. Right. Here's, here's a funny bit. So, the ninth ninth month of the year. Everybody in Galeri knows it as the month of Rova. 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 Not dwarves. Dwarves said, fuck that. To dwarves, the month is called Torash. 
because they think it's foolish to name a month after an evil, imprisoned god of destruction. Which they have a point. I've yeah. always thought it was weird that there was a month of Rova in Pathfinder. <laughs> they they have they absolutely have a point. There's, a, there's also one called there's also one for Zankuthan. True. With they, Rova, they have though, one for I feel like, Yeah. With Rova, I feel like you would want people to forget there's this god of destruction there so they would stop trying to free him. <laughs> Personally, that's my thought. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but beyond beyond the the month of Torash, there's not a whole lot that the church celebrates. Basically, just like successful battles that that particular that particular church participated in. Be that's about it, except for one thing. They do have a a holiday that some certain dwarven communities participate in called the Sky Lost. And this is a holiday that has ties to one of the lost Sky Citadels. And it's really kind of a, a day of remembrance for the, those, those families and those clans that can trace their lineage back to those lost Sky, Sky Citadels. And they can have a day of remembrance and a day of mourning to look back and see to think about how the those members of those communities now what's interesting is that not all not all not every dwarven community even from the same sky citadel will celebrate sky lost on the same day because different clans left this that their particular sky citadel on different days so the, each community will celebrate it based upon their particular clan and their particular lineage. And I marked it here that while we're recording this, it is Tuesday, May 30th. We in the United States just celebrated Memorial Day. This is basically the dwarven version of Memorial Day. It's a personal Memorial Day per clan, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I think before we go into Planar Allies, we just have, what, some aphorisms? aphorisms? Yeah. Oh, and I do want to go over the, the realm, that, that realm bit, that I teased at the very top. All right, you want, you want to run through, want to run us through the aphorisms there real quick, Mike? There is the hand with the hammer shapes the future. I mean... That's pretty much self-explanatory, right? Craft and inventions allow the dwarves and other civilized races to expand across the world. The artisan's mind thought up the first spear and hammer, the smelting of bronze and steel, and the construction of castles, clockworks, and even gunworks, uh, which is a much contested, uh, I find, issue in in, in role-playing games. Uh, but without these inventions, the civilized races would be like goblins. I find that very offensive huddled in the mud, fearing knowledge and worshiping simple concepts like fire and rocks. Again, I find that very offensive. Another one is, I mean, I play a goblin. I can't, you know. Another one is hops and water is not beer. I love this one. Which is such a good thing. It's such a good phrase to have. Inferior workmanship and anything less than one's best efforts are unacceptable to followers of Torag. No half measures. No self-respecting dwarf would call a cup of water and hops beer, that's in quotation marks, as such a thing is unfinished and unpalpable. And, and so no skilled weaponsmith would consider a poorly made hammer a true weapon. An interesting fact about this is apprentices call their unfinished items nicknames. For example, a hammerhead is a slug to avoid their teacher's reprimand. And an apprentice known for making frequent mistakes is, is often called a hopswatter in reference to this phrase. Among some, this phrase is uh, altered to hope in water is not beer. To be called hopswatter as a dwarf probably is like the biggest insult. <laughs> it's, prob 
probably like fighting words, you know what I mean? <laughs> no kidding. Just drop your hammer, what did you just say? <laughs> Let them break upon our shields. This is also very cool. Mm hmm Through Torak the Torak is a war god, he would rather protect his followers than seek and destroy their enemies. Uh, and encourage his people to always have a safe retreat. He doesn't, you know, sacrifice isn't his thing. Makes sense. The power of a strong, defensible physician has con has forced countless armies to give up their besieged, uh, the besieging of an impenetrable fortress. Uh, in some clans, this phrase is rendered as against our walls instead of upon our shields. So let them break upon our walls. Yep. Hammer and tongs. The best way I can describe this is that's their explan that's their exclamation, you know. That's like our uh, you know Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. I was gonna be I was gonna be real southern and be like, God damn stuff or, like that. Or ooh raw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or I mean probably even oofta. I don't know. Yeah. I, or for us Philly people, John. <laughs> so yeah you get what that means uh, the, uh, the final one is an anvil is nothing without fire priests use this phrase to teach that working without a goal means nothing and that fighting without purpose accomplishes nothing it pretty much goes with the whole you know yeah, don't don't go sacrificing yourself for no reason continue on persevere and maintain the saying reinforces Torax directive to wage war primarily as a defensive measure centered around the community, encouraging followers to pursue crafting with a goal in mind, and so forth. Uh, many dwarfs can recount tales of hearing these words as an uh, admonishment upon particularly reckless events during their youth. Yeah, I guess that's basically like saying, I don't know, don't put your, don't touch that stove. I guess is like the dwarven way of putting it or like, you know, you're going off half cocked type of thing. Right. And then real quick before we get into it. So I kind of teased it at the very top about the talk about heaven and the forge up in heaven. Was it the, what was the name? The particular forges that where Toreg sits the Forge Heart. Forge Heart. So, um, it's funny because, again, the, the, the Dwarven mythology is that Torag created Galarian. He created Galarian, he smithed it into life by, by with his hammer, and then he created the dwarves based off of the sparks that flew off of his hammer. And Heaven, to the dwarves, was always there because the, the heaven, the father of creation, the Toreg himself, he just kind of arrived there when he, when he chiseled his way from the outer sphere, he found himself in heaven. It's just like he did. He just kind of, became there just found themselves in he just found himself in heaven he was already inhabiting the mountains in heaven and he just kind of much like the dwarves when they erupted from the earth uh, from the dark lands during the quest for sky same thing with Torag he was like the first one there in heaven he just found he just kind of showed up and was like hey this is this is mine now and and he started I had all this raw material and started like finishing off and all these works and giving the raw materials to the archons and the angels and so on and so forth. So it's again, it's a little bit self congratulatory. And I, uh, and again, I think we're going to be recontextualizing a lot of dwarven mythology in Sky King's tomb. <laughs> I, I can't wait for version two of the dwarf video. I hope there's, enough new information I could put out a second part for it. Yeah, yeah. Before we get into the uh, planar allies, was there anything else that Steven that we want that you wanted to talk about that we missed that we skipped over? Let's see. 
I don't believe so. I think we covered just about everything. I had a few little notes spread around, but I do believe that's just about everything. Mm hmm. I know that the planar allies is Mike's thing. He likes going over the monsters and stuff. So. I mean, I like monsters. Uh, also, <laughs> the Sky Citadel that was given the key was Kragadan. It was Kragadan? Yeah. was Kragadan, yep. yeah. That was the one that was given the uh, the key. Yeah, I had a, in my very short-lived Iron Fang Invasion game, I had a dwarf from Kragadan. All right, so should we, let's go over the planar allies, and then we can call it a wrap. Yeah. Do you want to do the, the defender? So even you mentioned it, I just figured that was your the favorite. grand defender. Your grand defender. You can take that one first because that's probably the coolest yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I had uh, looked into the most. So I, was, I thought it was particularly cool. The grand defender is a massive dwarven golem crafted from iron that is basically piloted by the spirits of dozens of the greatest dwarven heroes. And the cool thing about this particular herald is that these spirits are fully able to interact with the normal world. Like they can recall their mortal lives. They are freely allowed to pass on memories and knowledge. So of like crafting schematics or just family knowledge, they can fully give that out as long as it doesn't interfere with their current reason for being on the mortal plane. They, uh, mortal dwarves will pray to the grand defender for lost secrets of forging and engineering. And it's kind of, it's kind of a built in way for the dwarves not to lose knowledge when a disaster may happen because you can always kind of have them come back and pass that info on later. But on top of just being a cool way to have the past stick around, the golem itself is particularly cool because when the golem is actually defeated, it will shut down for a few hours and then will shed its iron skin and form a smaller Grand Defender that just goes right back to wrecking shit. It's the nesting doll of doom. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> the, so previous, cool. the previous skin of it will decay into powder over 1d4 minutes. But uh, eventually, I would imagine, it will bulk back up over time. But um, it can change into a couple different forms. It can be cold iron, it can be mithril, or it can be um, plain iron that has the stats of... Um, adamantine Whoa. so uh yeah it's <laughs> it's particularly cool and it's got a poisonous breath weapon as well that it can use let alone the giant hammer it wields <laughs> awesome i um i really particularly like the the creature by the name of stone river which is a Unique Bulet, which is basically a souped up version of a Bulet that is smarter than your average Bulet. And it basically obeys Torag's will and has the and has a ruthless cunning that lets it function like basically a Bulet version of Craven the Hunter from from Spider Man. Like it is, it is like the an expert tracker and hunter, immune to fire. It can burrow through lava and magma. It's yeah. It's this thing is. It's nasty. I love it. You yeah. know, it's bad when its favorite activity is crunching Drugar bones. <laughs> <laughs> Say what you want. The Dwarven Pantheon is metal as hell. <laughs> yeah. oh, they yeah. really are. Yeah. Then those there's, there's uh, Relga, Shield Maiden. By the way, I had to look up how to say that. That H is totally silent in that name. Uh, she is a 
celestial dwarven werebear that serves <laughs> Torag with absolute loyalty. Yeah, she's a a blonde dwarf. And when she turns into a bear, she's a golden haired bear. What's more scary than a bear? One with gold hair. We've all seen cocaine super bear, right? Saiyan bear. Yeah, super yes. saiyan bear. Super saiyan bear. Yes. <laughs> it's a basically with, a super saiyan bear, yeah. A bear with smite a were bear with smite evil. That's what that's what's pretty scary to everything else. Uh, and then finally there's Ambassador Zorin, which is a cunning Azir noble. Uh, he is dispatched when Torag needs a gentler hand. One that, you know, less crush and go and more like, we should probably talk about this. And uh, if you don't know, an Azir is basically a flame dwarf, would be the best way to describe it, right? So it's an extra planar being that looks like a dwarf that's made of flames. Yeah, Azir. Azers are. Azers? Azers? Azars? Azers? Yes, yeah, they're all they're, right. they're, um. Apparently, they're going to get a big write up in um, Rage of Elements. And I think they're. From what I'm hearing is they're basically going to have a no they're going to they're going to have a lot more a lot more connection to dwarven mythology so which would explain why they look like dwarves so i have a feeling that i have a feeling that steven's theory about the a whole shake up in dwarven mythology is going to be going to be hitting us because Sky King's tomb is supposed to really shake up everything we know about the quest for Sky and Dwarven mythology and then the fact that they hinted at that Azers are going to have a much bigger impact on on Dwarven history is uh, makes me yeah I think all the all the pieces are lining up Steven I want to point out also, I released that video two years ago, so there was no rumors of a dwarf book coming out. There was no dwarven adventure path coming out. That was a complete shot in the dark. <laughs> hey, hey, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, and this one... <laughs> Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. <laughs> Jeez. All right. I think, uh, I think that about does it. Anything else, gentlemen, before we wrap up? I don't believe so. I think we covered pretty much everything. All right, sir. Steven, where can we find you? You can find me at Sir Vertigo on YouTube, and you can find links to my Discord, The Midnight Torch, on my YouTube. All right. Mike? Hey, guys. It's me, Mike. You can find me on a bunch of Discords and soon to be The Midnight Torch Discord as uh, Buster Knuckle. I'm also... Uh, Admiral at this moment, Lupus Gallo on 25 North. And I am thinking about making an Instagram of my AI art because I'm getting pretty good at it and everyone says it's pretty cool and I just want to share it because everyone needs good artwork for stuff. Also, That's right. when in doubt, always support your, your local artists. Always, yes. always, always. I just say that because I technically am not an artist. I'm just a guy who's really, really good at words. That's it. And for me, um, I'm Jason, GM for the 25 North Podcast. You're listening to this on the 25 North Podcast feed, so you know already know who I am. You guys, take take it easy. May your party never end. We'll see ya. I'm also Rum Grub. I forgot. <laughs>